Welcome, everyone, and thank you for watching. The decision by Israel's parliament to dissolve has set off shockwaves in the country and an explosion of blame. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu pointing his finger squarely at Avigdor Lieberman for bringing down the Knesset only days after it was sworn in. Lieberman, leader of the Israel Beitenu party, is not backing down. He's answered back that the blame falls on Netanyahu for his failure at forming a coalition. And at the heart of the government's collapse, Lieberman's demand of an increase in the level of participation of ultra-Orthodox Jews in the Israeli military. It's a very divisive issue that involves politics and also has security implications. I-24's defense correspondent Daniel Tzemach reports. The controversial draft law calling for more ultra-Orthodox to be conscripted to the IDF. It's the reason Israel is heading to a second round of elections. Israel's ultra-Orthodox are almost entirely exempt from military service. This has been the case since 1948, but things are changing and security experts suggest this law may indeed be necessary to continue maintaining a functioning military. That is to say, it's not just a political issue dividing right-wing parties. Um, an increasing percentage of society will um, fall under the ultra-Orthodox category. And as a result, the IDF, which views itself um, as a people's army, is concerned by the fact that a growing percentage of the population will not serve. And that will create a fracture and a, a rupture in national solidarity. But some still view the law as more of a symbolic fight over the societal nature of the state and less about military needs. But even a small number seems to have great significance, which is why the Israeli military signed off on it. It was proposed and formulated by the defense establishment itself. So I think that these numbers reflect what the uh, IDF sees as a moderate um, demand on Haredi society. For now, this bill will again be shelved, at least until after a new government is formed. But shelved or not, symbolic or not, it's dragged Israelis back to the polls, and if it again remains unresolved, the implications could be felt not only in the coming months, but in the coming years. Daniel Tzemach, I-24 News. All right, to help break this down, we're joined by Matthew Brodsky. He's a senior fellow at the Security Studies Group, and Martin Himmel, an international security analyst. Thank you both for being with us. Matthew, Lieberman was, as we know, insisting that ultra-Orthodox Jews no longer be exempt from military service. This is a very controversial issue. It resonates with a lot of secular Israelis. Do you see the selection now being a referendum on these specific policies? Is Haredi or ultra-Orthodox exceptionalism going to be a big issue in the election now, or is it still mostly a referendum on Netanyahu? I, I think all the above. You see, the way it's it, this has become, as you say, a very big issue. And clearly, Lieberman, by sticking to it, sticking to his guns and saying, this is the one issue upon which I will let the country go to new elections, has forced it to, uh, to really has forced the issue to the forefront. But the thing is, we're still going to be stuck, most probably, after the elections, with the same type of math, you know, he may increase his seats amongst those who think that this is the most important issue. And it is an important issue, no matter what part of the debate you're on. But is this, the math is still going to be the right-wing uh, ultra-Orthodox coalition is still probably going to have more numbers than there are in Lieberman's camp. And when Netanyahu, if he's the one who wins or gets to put together a coalition, mm -hmm. it's that kind of math that is, you know, it, those two, Lieberman and the ultra Orthodox, are clearly not going to play, I don't think, in the same house. So it's still the same type of decision that Netanyahu right. is going to have to make. Well, a lot of finger pointing was happening today, Martin. Uh, Netanyahu getting a lot of the blame for failing to form this right. coalition government. A lot of people blaming Lieberman for refusing to back down. Who do you think is to blame here? I think it, what's to blame here is uh, the myopic vision that there must be only a right-wing or a left-wing coalition. Really what the Israeli voter has said, that they want a center coalition. And I'm wondering a little bit if there's a Machiavelli maneuver here that uh, Lieberman is uh, trying to uh, put into the system, and that is force the elections. We'll get a very similar result. There's going to be some erosion and confidence in Netanyahu's leadership and say, hey, maybe the guns and whoever's leading the Likud should set up a coalition, and then you take that whole ultra-Orthodox pressure away. 
Well, the latest poll, and granted, it's a very fresh poll, but it's the Jerusalem Post Mariv newspaper poll, and it shows that if the election was held now, Israel Beitenu would increase from its current five seats to nine, so Lieberman's wow. gamble would pay off. And Likud would also gain two seats from 35 to, to 37. So they would even do better if uh, former Justice Minister Ayelet Shaked rejoins Likud, then they'd be up to 41 seats. Uh, Blue and White Party would drop by two seats. Again, very early poll, very premature to, to go based on this. But what do you think? Well, let's look at that again. If uh, it is very premature, if uh, Israel Beitenu, Lieberman's party, gets that kind of power, that's even more power to determine whether there'll be a government or not, despite the fact that Likud would also get more. So he's again in a very pivotal position. And I think that what he's trying to do is try to get whatever Gantz will have and whatever Likud will have, maybe under a Likud government, uh, more towards the center and then get policies which he really uh, aspires to because Likud and Gantz, they both want what Lieberman wants. The ones who oppose that are the ultra-Orthodox. Now they're shoved a bit to the side and the center increases. That's a whole different political dimension. All right, with all this uh, finger pointing going on, uh, we did hear from oh, yeah. the uh, a former prime minister, Ehud Olmert. He stopped by the I-24 News studios in Tel Aviv and had some choice words <laughs> to describe Netanyahu. Let's take a listen. Pathetic. I looked at him and I know what he feels. He knows that he is a loser. Uh, I know that it doesn't fit in with the perception normally of uh, Netanyahu, but uh, Netanyahu uh, said things which are untrue from the beginning to the end of his speech. Ouch! Calling him a liar and a loser. Matt, what's your reaction? It's it's interesting. It's it sounds like politics here in the United States, <laughs> you know, more recently. But these, this is the kind of language uh, that you would that you would hear there. Now, of course, you have with Olmert uh, the fact that he had to serve time for corruption and. Let's you let's not gloss Yahoo over that. <laughs> that. This is a prime minister that did, in fact, get charged with corruption and did, in fact, I'm... serve time for corruption. But go on, Matt. Right. Right, so you know, I'm just a lowly American. <laughs> I don't want to, you know, cast too many dispersions on, uh, on on all the parties out there. But right, I imagine that that's kind of be has to be a little annoying if you're Olmert. And look, Netanyahu has really managed to hang on to power and become very popular for a long period of time. He's been able to use a masterful type of strategy. He's been able to form coalitions where coalitions need him more than he needs them. At least that is the way it's been. And there's every reason, not every reason, but there's many reasons that you could come up right. with a path where things work out, and he's strengthened at the end of this. Yeah, it could work out for the best. Martin, with all of this political infighting going on and this chaos in the government, how do you think Israel's enemies are viewing all of this? And there's certainly no shortage of enemies. Do they think Israel is in a more vulnerable position right now? I don't think so. I think that uh, there's a clear-cut difference in Israel between all this political fighting and when if there's a threat there's a clear hierarchy where the prime minister is the prime minister the government is the government and the, the army is the army so uh, there's a, a certain a substantial deterrence that's going on to keep Iran at bay and Gaza at bay so I don't think they are going to meddle with anything right now. All right, Martin, thank you so much. Appreciate it, Martin Himmel, Matthew Brodsky. Thank you so much. Matt, please stick around. We've got one more topic to talk to you about, and that is uh, the Saudis, because uh, they've gathered Arab leaders together for an emergency summit to deal with attacks on their tankers and pipelines. And here in the U.S., President Trump has promised a big announcement regarding the border. That promise comes as border agents make a record arrest at the El Paso crossing. You're watching Clear Cut Plus coming to you live from New York City. Welcome back. I'm Michelle McCorry. Saudi Arabia convened an emergency summit with Arab leaders in Riyadh today. The leaders want to deliver a strong message to Iran that regional powers will defend their interests against threats. Saudi's foreign minister is saying that attack on Gulf oil facilities must be addressed with strength and firmness. Riyadh has accused Tehran of ordering the drone strikes on its oil assets. Tehran has denied involvement 
in either attack. Back with me now is Matt Brodsky, a senior fellow with the Security Studies Group. Matt, uh, some strong words from Saudi Arabia's foreign minister. He was urging fellow Muslim nations to confront Iran with, quote, all means of force and firmness. What do you think he means by that? What exactly is he calling for here? <laughs> Look, I, when the uh, when the WikiLeaks came out years ago, there was a cable that that showed uh, I forget who it was from Saudi Arabia saying uh, that uh, what the United States should do is cut the head off the snake in Iran. This is before the nuclear agreement uh, came to be. So this type of language is nothing necessarily new. I think what is new here, though, is the fact that. It is them coming together, the Gulf Cooperation Council, number one. Number two, this shows that, again, these are real threats. And there are mm -hmm. talking points in the United States and parts of Europe that really try to downplay this as though this is some imaginary threat that Trump and Bolton concocted to go to war. That's not the case. The other part, Qatar was invited. This is a thaw in a relationship, and I don't think you would see that without the prodding of the Trump administration for a number of reasons, and that's part of what makes this very unique. And if successful, would send a very strong solidarity-type message to Iran. And again, to your point, if Qatar showed up, it really does indicate that they view this as a very serious threat as well. Matt, uh, Bolton was saying today that he is, in fact, on the same page as President Trump regarding Iran, that regime change is not really the Trump administration's objective. Let's take a listen. You know, on Iran, uh, the president's policy uh, is not regime change. It never has been. Uh, I've said many, many things over the years before I took this job uh, on a wide variety of subjects. I've hardly hidden my views under a bushel basket. Uh, but in this job, I'm the national security advisor. I'm not the national security decision maker. And uh, obviously, the president dictates the policy. Uh, and that's certainly true on North Korea as well. The president is very determined that neither Iran nor North Korea will get deliverable nuclear weapons. Uh, he has been fully prepared to negotiate with either or both countries. So, Matt, what do you make of that? What is the objective here? I mean, is it to somehow force the regime in Tehran to come back to the negotiating table and to actually agree to a deal that does, in fact, prevent uh, nuclear weapons? Yeah, I think the goal all along has been, number one, first, Get them to the table uh, and have an agreement, a new agreement that scraps the old thing, which is inherently flawed, you know, it's built in there, and to make one that actually works and that would, of course, address Iran's rogue behavior throughout the region. Uh, that is something that's extremely important. Right. Now, of course, there is a 12-point plan that Pompeo put out. There are 12 points that they would like to see uh, Iran adhere to, which are, as he has said, they're actual behaving like a normal country, like try not to blow up people in Europe, you know, stop undermining other countries. Normal requests. Now, <laughs> if the regime were to fall, okay, I don't think the administration is going to shed any tears, but that's not what the stated policy is. Either way, there's one way to get to want to, to this, and, and that is maximum pressure. So any right. European idea that, like, let's remove some, that doesn't work. It undermines the entire idea. Yeah. Increase the pressure, maximum pressure. Matt, thank you so much. Matt Brodsky. We're well, moving from one crisis in the Middle East to a